Today's video is about advanced build crafting, and this is going to be a long one, but I promise you the information presented today is worth your time. So grab some snacks, kick back, and maybe follow along in Destiny with me and with the video on the side. So getting started, I think the best way for somebody to start build crafting is to ask and answer some questions about what you like in Destiny to begin with. Like, what are your weapon preferences? So, for example, I like hand cannons. Uh, my number one weapon is the last word. I have the most kills on it, so that would probably be my answer. If not, I'd be using a legendary hand cannon with Icarus Grip. That's what I like to use. Now, some things to keep in mind is that some classes between Titan Hunter and Warlock have different exotics which amplify weapon use. So, for example, my Hunter uses Lucky Pants because those amplify hand cannons. They have faster ready speed and drastically increased accuracy. So what this means is that my last word becomes very consistent on mouse and keyboard. It also has something called hand cannon holster. So this means at zero cost, I can reload my Hawkmoon in my backpack, which helps me land a final round more consistently. You also have to consider that the mod cost is more for hand cannons compared to something like a pulse rifle at 3. Snipers are also more costly than shotguns at 3. So this means when I'm putting together a final product, I can't afford to put a stat mod here like mobility or recovery. Also, if you liked bows for example, hunters for some reason can ability jump with a bow fully drawn. To get this effect on Titan or Warlock, Titan has to use an exotic called Lion Rampant Boots, which allow you to hip fire in the air while your jump is active. Or you have to play Top Tree Dawn Blade to get a similar effect to Hunter with bows. If you like submachine guns, the Titan has an exotic called Peacekeepers, which give you five tiers of mobility as well as a faster strafe speed with submachine guns and a variety of bonuses. I think Hunters also get sidearms with Mechaneer's Trick Sleeves, though I think you can use those pretty strong on any class. I actually think that Hunters have pretty good, sub uh, pretty good sidearm builds that are specifically not using Mechaneer's Trick Sleeves anyway, so don't worry about that one too much. So some mod elements also work for certain weapons, like for example, you have to have an Arc Element Armor if you want the quick charge mod, which adds 25 handling to your shotgun. So that really helps you draw a shotgun faster. But if you had, for example, surplus, it does that for you, it might not help. So when I have three abilities charged on this found verdict, it's going to be at 99 handling and that quick charge is only a 25 boost. So it would only be a one boost to 100. It doesn't go over. However, let's say I use my abilities. Now suddenly I really value that. But let me quickly pull a shotgun out of dim. I want to get a quick draw shotgun. I'll just show you what I'm doing on screen. Handling is still beneficial to a quick draw shotgun because after one second after pulling the weapon out, it goes back to its native handling, which is around, let's check dim. It's around 68. So it's gonna make it feel nearly maxed at all times. However, if I can't afford that mod, then quick draw is the next best thing. So keep this in mind whenever you are considering your final build with armor. Since sniper unflinching costs so much, I usually don't account for it. And you see I actually don't have any unflinching here, which is usually something that I don't compromise on. Well, the thing is, when you fire from the hip, you can't get unflinching perks. They don't do anything. So since this is a last word centric build, I just don't account for it whatsoever, which lets me put extra mods in places like mobility and recovery so I can reach 10 and 10. So the next important question to ask is, well, what is your playstyle? What is your win condition? Destiny shares elements from many different game genres. I feel that Destiny playstyles are a varying mix of the following ideas. Rushdown, Zone, Disrupt, Defense, Ramp, 
and rogue. And those may sound like some random terms, but I promise they're borrowed from various genres, uh, deck builders, fighting games, MMOs, etc. And I'm going to try to define and give some examples to those to clear it up. So let's go with Rushdown first. This is kind of what you think of when you see a hunter. I'm going to show you one of my Rushdown builds, see if I can get this. So this is 10 to 10 hunter with 10 strength because I'm trying to plan for a future void 3.0 where I will be using the bottom smoke. Uh, typically, if I was running any other class, I would switch to higher discipline, medium intellect, and very, very minimally low strength as low as possible because gamblers dodge if you dodge near somebody gives you your melee back for free so let's talk about rushdown this is very speedy agile and great at applying forward pressure these builds make your opponent guess whether or not they should keep out their primary hand cannon or their shotgun when you're approaching them in close quarter space because of how rapidly you can change direction and how fast you are it's the definition of agile and that's what stompies are. With control jump, you can neutral jump towards them, then ability jump backwards and immediately be in hand cannon distance outside of shotgun distance while they have a shotgun in their hands wondering if they made a mistake or not. And I'm not here to talk about whether or not stompies are balanced compared to other things. I'm talking about build crafting. So some examples of a rushdown class would be Peacekeeper SMG Behemoth. And I do have that build. So let's go check that out really quick. So what a Peacekeeper Behemoth wants to do is it wants to cut space in the map. It wants to make every part of the map SMG distance. You can see I was toying around with Ashen Wake. And I'll talk about those later when I talk about the ramp playstyle. So let's go with PK Behemoth 9 Rec. I made some adjustments to try to fit 10 recovery here and we'll see that come into play in a sec when I switch to behemoth because this is a behemoth build. I get the extra stat line from my fragments which give me 10 resilience, 10 recovery, and another 10 resilience. Now I named this 9 recovery because my charge with light mods were a little bit different. If I want to fit a shotgun scavenger then I have to potentially get rid of one of my recovery stat lines. Um, how I can get this back is to simply farm armor with higher recovery. Uh, recovery costs 4 and every other stat costs 3. Where the partial mod costs 2 and the other partials cost 1. And this makes a huge difference which means I had to compromise on a shotgun scavenger on this specific build. I farmed a shotgun to go along with this. This is a heritage. It can get really high handling. It can get 96 handling with fluted and a handling masterwork. And I was farming for that initially, but then I realized that I was going to put quick charge on this build anyway. I had room for it. So if I'm putting quick charge on it for a free 25 handling, then that means I can switch to the next best thing, which is a range site and a handling masterwork. I think the only permutation of this would be like a five range bonus and I'm not farming again for that. I think this is a perfect shotgun for my build. I borrowed this from a player called Nom3, Nom3, however you pronounce it, as well as Cool Cheese and another player called Lunars. All of these players push the Peacekeeper Titan very, very far and I borrow elements from each of their builds, but this is the closest to Nom's build. So this uses Teraba, an exotic submachine gun, Stores power when dealing or receiving damage, which means you have to keep the weapon out. This does not work when it's stowed in your backpack when you have your shotgun out. So, I need my shotgun to reload in the background, which means that I need to be able to afford a shotgun holster, which as we know, I can't. And even if I could, I would prefer to have a shotgun scavenger, just so I can have extra bullets for taking out revives, taking out titan barricades, that kind of thing. And obviously I want the handling as fast as possible, so in those emergency situations when I need to switch off my SMG in close quarters, I can do that pretty quick. You might be thinking, an experienced Destiny player, saying there is no way you play good opponents using an SMG and a shotgun. Won't they just backpedal? 
Well, that's where the beauty of this build comes in, and this is why I classify it as Rushdown. You throw a glacier grenade in front of you to cut space. Now, you walk up to the glacier nade and you throw a barricade. Or you run past the glacier nade and throw a barricade. Either way, it kind of cuts space in the map until your opponent is cornered and realizes that there is only SMG distance left. You can use the extended slide to help close the distance. You can use the damage resistance that you get for being near a crystal to help close the distance and equalize that time to kill even if you're out of SMG distance. So I think this is a really good example of Rushdown. Stompy Hunter would be the other one. If you like Stasis on Hunter, you could also go the Bakris Helmet. So let's look. This gives you a short distance teleport at the cost of your dodge. It has to be on the ground, but it is significantly better than Blink. And speaking of Blink, I also consider that a Rushdown class. I use Astrocyte Verse, but you can also get away with transversive steps, although I think your positioning has to be even more perfect. I like the extra handling speed that Astrocyte gives you as well as the situational awareness. I just think it's overall a better on average exotic than transversive for specifically Blink. And with the rushdown playstyle, you throw a zoning grenade, you cut space again, you blink through cover so that you stay safe from sniper rifles, and eventually they will run out of map and have to deal with your hand cannon shoddy. Uh, speaking of zoning, I think that's the next one we're going to talk about. So, zoner is exactly what it sounds like. It controls space, strong area denial, and the goal is to make the enemy more predictable. You might have noticed that when Trials of Osiris used to be the zone capture, that zoner builds started rising up. You started seeing lightning grenade builds, you started seeing solar flare builds, you started seeing overcharged vortex grenade builds, you started seeing young Ahamkara spine comes out. Uh, recently, cold snaps, uh, not not that, uh, recently, turret uh, might have got some changes here. Let me try that one again. Uh, you also saw turret shade binders come up. Uh, what I was going to say is dust fields got the buff. So this grenade. Base cooldown can go all the way down to 24 seconds. So what this means is that you can have like a very lethal... Um, Zoner kit. I'm about to show you this on Hunter. I made this yesterday and tried it out explicitly for this video. I call this the Bomba Zoner. I'll think about the name later. This either runs Bottom Tree Night Stalker or Stasis. You want as much discipline and as much strength as possible. If I shuffle around these builds, I don't want to mess up my Stompy build right now. It's going to show 10 mobility, 3 resilience, 8 Recovery, 10 Discipline, 3 Intellect, and 7 Strength. That's what it's going to show. And what it does is it uses Wither Horde, Bombardiers, Slow Dodge, and Touch of Winter with 24 second Dust Fields. And so the way that this one zones is I shoot a Wither Horde out, I throw a Dust Field so they cannot escape the Wither Horde, and even if they do, then I dodge to slow them down, and even if they don't get slowed by it, if they decide to rush me down since they know I don't have a shotgun, there's a parting gift. So the win condition with this class is to blind throw a shuriken. You try to gambler's dodge to get your shuriken back if you really do need it. And if your shuriken hits some, something, just shoot the wither horde. Then what you can do is throw a dust field behind the wither horde and dodge away. It covers all three options at once. Either they stand in the wither horde, or they get stuck in the dust field and get primaried, or they rush you down, get slowed, and then have to eat a bombardier. If you team up with like a bottom tree night stalker to make you invisible, to make you getting in a little bit easier, this is the ultimate zoner. And I got teabagged and hate mail all day yesterday running this, and I was just doing it for proof of concept. So yeah, cold snaps were on my mind. Which uh, brings us to the next archetype, which is the Disrupt archetype. Um, at some point in 2021, me and my friend group was sick of the radar. So we started running an old boot called Gemini Jesters. Uh, to fix these, I think I need to remod the Jester. But just know that my usual stat line is 
10 mobility, 2 resilience, 9 recovery, 10 discipline, 4 intellect, and 2 strength. A measly 2 strength. I run it two different ways. I either run it on Revenant with Glacier Grenades so that I can have the most uptime on Glacier, which kind of like the Titan cuts space. I use it as platforms though. And I also use it on Flux Grenade to have a sniper rifle instant kill sticky at any point in the match. It can be as low as 35 seconds if I hurt myself with the synergy of Bottom Tree Arc Strider. But let's talk about the Geminis. What is Disrupt? Disrupt is about sneaking, suppressing, and just generally annoying. They take away information from opponents or make them distrust known information. Uh, so for example, if you use the snare bomb, this will ping their radar and they don't know whether or not it's a snare bomb or a player unless they check or hear the sound cue. So it might make them distrust information on the radar. So them being overall in uncomfortable not knowing things sometimes makes them move, which is good. It makes them, uh, for example, I'm going to give you a golden gun example. I think this exotic solves golden gun. Because if you pop a golden gun, they just look at the radar and go the opposite direction you go. And then you run in a circle, Benny Hill style, and nothing gets solved. So what I like to do, and I learned this from Lunars, is I pop my golden gun, I dodge with Gemini, and then I just stand still. Eventually, the pressure makes my opponent crack, and they just jump out into the open, expecting me to be close to them, and expecting to shotgun the golden gun as a last-ditch effort. Meanwhile, I'm just standing there. I'm fully content not even using my golden gun, and I just get a free kill. It happens so often. So this is a perfect example of Disrupt. Another one would be Gemini, uh, sorry, Graviton with uh, Way of the Trapper, or even Bottom Tree. I have a very nasty gargoyle build where it just perpetually goes invisible with Vanish and Smoke and sits on off angles. Uh, the other one would be Axion Bolt Voidwalker. If you just purely spec in to the Axion Bolt to make people move, kind of disrupt their fortress. And the final one, you know Cold Snaps were on my mind, uh, is Cold Snap. I did a recent video where I explored cold snap grenades with these variable cooldowns and it turns out that like axiom bolts cold snap makes your opponent jump and if you know that they're going to jump they might lose some accuracy or they get frozen to it and even if you land a freeze on the warlock it chain freezes it can really mess up a team with just one simple grenade toss as long as you're ready to follow it up so that's a good example the next archetype would be defense and that is what I was running in this week's Trials of Osiris. We're going to go over to my Warlock. So defense is about staying alive, distracting, taking aggro, making the opponent overcommit. It preys on impatience and poorly synchronized teams. You essentially want your op opponent to be bored of the game and push you out of frustration. So I was using a sniper rifle with this. We'll just use my last remaining Tatara Gaze instead. Think my frozen orbits on my Hunter. The way that this build works is I throw down a Rift with Boots of the Assembler. And by standing in the Rift, it creates a Noble Seeker, which gives my teammates, if they're near me, a bonus, depending on the Rift I chose. They get healed if it's a Healing Rift and bonus damage if it's an Empowering Rift. So I go Empowering with a two minute grace. I switch around the subclass depending on what the opponent is to give them the most trouble, but I usually just default to a two minute grace in this meta. I could also go for a really fast firebolt grenade if I want 24 second as opposed to 40. So how does this work? Lumina has an interesting interaction with Boots of the Assembler where by standing in the rift, I eventually get noble rounds for free, which I normally have to get a kill and then collect these seekers. And then by hip firing the seeker into my teammates, both my teammate and myself get a damage boost, which allows my aggressive uh, sniper rifle to one shot to the body if they are below five resilience. Stay with me now. I know that was a lot to take in. The reason that I say this is a defensive style is because the longer I sit, the worse it gets for my opponent. And that's a theme that I tried to build into a lot of my finalized builds. So on this trials map, 
I would use my rift as bait. Sometimes I wouldn't even stand in my own rift and I would later use a, a teammate's healing rift instead to give me my noble. By throwing a rift near the edge and then just standing somewhere near the rift but not exactly in the rift makes my opponent instantly throw three grenades. So I'm trading my rift for three of my opponent grenades and I think that's a really good uh, trade. And if they don't grenade my rift, well then I decide to use my rift and we just sit and wait for noble rounds until we get a buff. Once my opponent realizes what's going on, they're going to play really aggressive to try to counter this defensive playstyle, which is what I wanted to begin with. I want them to push me, I want the game to get over with fast. So, despite it being defensive, I think it does solve something. Uh, I just mentioned Disrupt earlier. You might think playing Disrupt playstyles are cheesy, but if it's in the effort to make somebody move, is it really cheesy? I mean, it gets the game over with, it gets the action, no more camping, but I digress. Some more examples of defense styles would be Stag Warlock and Rhyme Behemoth. A lot of people know the Stag Helmet gives damage resistance in the Rift as well as faster Rift cooldowns in general for just getting damaged, which you're going to do anyway. So a key tendency of a defensive player is they try to establish mid, and if they fail, they back up and they set up a fortress. And if you don't push that fortress soon, it's going to get really bad for you in the future. The ne Speaking of that theme, Ramp takes the idea of it getting worse for you in the future to the next level. So Ramp bets into a future strong late game or has some impractically specific startup cost to gain an incredible advantage. So an example of this is going to be a Crest of Alpha Loopy Bubble Titan where they have a decent kit at the beginning but they're really just banking on getting bubbles for the future so that they can share orbs between each other's bubbles. You also have Ashen Wake which requires a grenade kill, specifically a fusion grenade kill, to instantly refresh the fusion grenade. And there's a certain build with the throwing hammer that you can keep building up fusion grenade kills into one-hit kill fusions. It's either hammer or fusion kills to build those up. The inverse of that is with the hammer with Worm God's Caress. So you can get multiple melee kills to eventually build to a one-hit hammer. And once you have the one-hit fusion or the one-hit hammer, you feel like a god in that lobby for a little bit. But in order to get that, it was a very specific startup cost. On Hunter, didn't forget about you, you have the Star Eater scale, which tries to do something similar to the Crest of Alpha Loopy Titan. And if you want the hint, just party up with the Crest of Alpha Loopy Titan and run something like Blade Barrage. You will get your Blade Barrage first, use it, then... Once your Titan throws it, Star Eater Scales will give you more super energy. So you can use the next Blade Barrage a little bit earlier. Your net super economy and maybe Trials will be very good, but of course you have to go without Stompies for a little bit. Or maybe you just swap between them. Another example would be Mantle of Battle Harmony on Warlock, which I think in this meta is an amazing pick. For Sixes, it's fun because once you have a super, it gives you extra damage on the weapon that matches the subclass element. Otherwise, it just gets you a faster super, which in Trials absolutely matters, especially if you run a well Warlock, especially an aggressive one. The Hunter alternative is Raiju's Harness, one that I like a lot, because it lets you cancel your Arc Strider early, which helped your super economy. But it's dead in the water if you don't have a super, so... This is why I put it in the ramp archetype, and the ramp archetype exists. Destiny has a lot of these, where your win condition is way later or way too specific. The final archetype is one that doesn't fit in with the others. It's deliberately anti-meta and has an element of surprise to the opponent. They call this archetype in card games Rogue. So Rogue. An example of this would be Path of the Burning Steps. I know some people use this for solar damage, but it is a rogue pick if stasis is popular because you are harder to slow or freeze. Another example of rogue would be something just to throw off an opponent, something they haven't really seen before. Like Lucky Raspberry, which deals with luck by the way, so it's even more rogue than you think. 
So Arc Bolts have a chance to chain each time it deals damage. And if you pair this with something like, I don't know, Trinity Ghoul, which for succeeding with arc kills, whether it's weapon or ability, it gives you an arc bolt arrow. And that doesn't really work with Lucky Raspberry, but by comboing both of them together, you can instant wipe a team and refresh your arc bolt. And so it keeps your opponent always guessing and surprised because they A, have never really dealt with it before, and then B, they don't know how many arc bolts you're about to throw in a row. How lucky are they going to be? Can I push this guy after I got hit by an arc bolt? How do I know if he had one or didn't? Then we get a rogue strategy of a rogue strategy where you're like, all right, I know he's banking everything on Lucky Raspberry and Trinity Ghoul, so why don't I just go Risk Runner? Why don't I get an Osmosis weapon in the Kinetic slot? Let's look this up. With uh, Ricochet Rounds, why don't I throw an Art Grenade and I damage myself with Ricochet Rounds to proc Risk Runner? Which reads, taking any arc damage, this weapon becomes overcharged and kills extend it. It pretty much does the arc bolt effect for landing shots while in this overcharged state. So if you get tagged by an arc bolt, suddenly you have the better weapon now, even though you have less health. And you get to nuke a team if they stand shoulder to shoulder. So a rogue strategy exists for the rogue strategy. Just always keep these in mind and be ready to say GG. If in your eyes you might have gotten cheesed when in reality they pick something you have never dealt with before and you just didn't really know what to do yet. You're going to be surprised a lot because Destiny has a lot of rogue strategies. I see people all the time just spinning up sweet business even though in a competitive match it really hasn't ever been used. So now that you understand the archetypes that exist within Destiny build crafting, you can answer that question a little bit better of what is your playstyle? Just know that nothing in Destiny sticks to one playstyle strictly and is a mix or a spectrum of all of the ones that exist. So you might be, I don't know, 80% disrupt and 20% rushdown. You might be 50 rushdown, 50 zoner. You might be 10% of most and mostly rogue. It's just how it works. So keep that in mind. Hopefully, it leads you to an answer of what builds you ultimately want once you establish the playstyle that you're trying to create. So the next question is, what are you not willing to compromise on? This could be a stat line like 10 recovery on Warlock since it's tied to the Rift. This could be inner accuracy like never using an exotic hand cannon. This could be hip fire like specifically using Dead Man's Tail, the BXR Battler. Uh, DMT, um, last word, um, those kind of things. It might be handling speed, where you have to have quick draw, or you have to have quick charge, or you have to use Ophidian Aspect, or Dragon Shadow. So for those who don't know, Ophidian Aspect gives, is it 32 handling? Someone's going to have to quote that exactly in the comment section. Or Dragon Shadow, which dodging gives you handling buffs, it's max handling. So that might be the compromise, where you have to have the fastest draw weapon. A scavenger might be the compromise, where you have to get extra bullets on pickup. Maybe it's targeting, like in the case of this build. I made no compromise, I wanted both sniper and hand cannon targeting, because they're both very beneficial to the build. And I took some hits on the stat line, like for example, I can't get to 6 resilience, which is a very special number to reach if you're dealing with Thorn. Thorn can two-head one body you if you are below six resilience. It's fringe, but it does come up and it's something to consider and was a cost that I had to account for. It might also be a charge with light perk that you compromise on. On every build, I account for powerful friends. So it's a free plus 20 mobility, but I have to have an arc element and another arc slot. So this could be Something like Invigoration, it only costs one. Let me put that Snipe Scab back on. Or it could also mean that I pair Radiant Light on another slot so that both of the arc uh, satisfy each other. And this is a plus 20 strength. And casting the super causes nearby allies to become charged with light. And then since I'm using Powerful Friends, if I become charged with light, nearby allies become charged with light. And if both me and my teammates are running this, they bounce off of each other, 
and we get a free one or two charge with light for free, uh, which we use high energy fire to give us a damage bonus. So I usually never compromise on powerful friends and some sort of other arc bonus. So always powerful friends. So you need to account for those kind of compromises before farming because some combinations may be impossible due to mod cost. For example, if my armor had higher inherent minor uh, recovery, I might not have to use a minor recovery mod here and can instead use it on something like a minor discipline, which would then give me a high energy fire option here, which would free up some space on my bond. So just know that certain stat lines um, are worth prioritizing and that's why I say list your compromises first before you farm. So my compromises for this build is, well, I can't have inner accuracy. It has to be Lumina, has to be Lumina. So I need hand cannon and sniper targeting. Since I value sniping, I want a sniper scavenger. I always do powerful friends, which means I need the cheapest arc um, slot. Since I'm going sniper scav, I can't also fit invigoration. So it's gonna be radiant light by default. I want to go unflinching on my Lumina since this is a low aim assist hand cannon and the chance of me missing a shot is very high. So I keep asking myself questions like this and eventually it makes it easier to slot the rest of the mods. I would be willing to give up grenade kickstart. I would be willing to give up taking charge. I'd be willing to give up one utility kickstart, but not two. So that's some examples. Uh, in general, though, I want to give you guys some rules of thumb. So in general, I always try to have at least one targeting, at least one unflinching, at least one scavenger, and the throw distance mod on my gloves, which cost one. And this does complicate a lot of builds in the future, but I'm just used to what fastball throw distance is on every grenade type, and I can't see myself ever going back. Keep in mind, it's also throw speed, so that means your grenade reaches the target a little bit faster, which I think is a difference maker in winning matches. The next compromise I never make is resilience. On my hunter, I never go below two. On my warlock, I never go below five. And I never go below nine on my titan. Let's talk about the titan. I'm actually gonna load up something real quick so you can see it in real time. There are fringe exceptions, by the way, for everything I'm saying, and that's the beauty of build crafting. So I'm gonna go to the EDZ coast. Let's take a look. There was a reason that I went for exactly nine resilience. That's because with nine resilience and two utility kickstarts, I can loop my barricade, which means that before it goes away naturally, I can just throw another one, which means that my job as a defense style build is a lot better. So on defense style builds for Titan, uh, this is something that I never compromise on. So now we, we wait, utility kickstart does its job. You're gonna see it start to glow a little bit of dust around the edges that show it's about to go away. And before it goes away, just throw another one. And so now if my opponent's looking at me with a sniper rifle, he thinks eventually this is gonna go away. Nah fam, it's still here. And so then I try to wait until I can safely toss my glacier nade. Then I move up to the glacier nade. Rinse, repeat, and now we cut some space on the map. So what was previously sniper distance is now SMG distance. So that's one example of why I specifically go for nine resilience on my Titan. For my Hunter, I go for two, not because I'm trying to counter meta stuff, but because I just don't care about the stat really on my Hunter. And I know going below two, you kind of have to try to go below two. You usually get two by accident. And uh, yeah, I just value mobility recovery more. But what I do value on my Hunter is mobility. I want that 10 at all times.
So how did I build this one? So this mod gets changed to mobility. This is my Kepri Sting build. It works with any tree. I want mobility because mobility equals my dodge. My dodge equals outreach. So by dodging, I get melee energy. On my gloves, I have melee kickstart. So using my melee gives me melee energy. And then I have gambler's dodge. So dodging near somebody, guess what? Gives me melee energy. I have both my targetings, my single unflinching, my single scavenger. Every compromise I usually have was met. And so what this means is I throw a smoke at my feet. I shoot my smoke, melee my smoke. And because I'm using Kepri Sting, I get wall hacks for three seconds. And with Dead Man's Tail or a sniper rifle, three seconds is all you need. You can absolutely win around off just that three seconds alone, which is why I made this build. And in general, I always shoot for 10 mobility on my hunter because not only is it stray speed, it's your dodge. And your dodge is usually the startup engine for a lot of things as well as just having it saves your life more often than not. Maybe more often than resilience might save me because it's an all or nothing type thing. But then again, if somebody's using my Lumina Empowering Rift sniper rifle setup, I need five resilience to tank that unless there's a fringe case. And I'll talk about those fringe cases later. Uh, in general, I try not to drop below nine recovery. A uh, reaching 10 is a pretty noticeable buff to recovery, but nine isn't so slow that it's not competitive. For the intellect stat, I don't really have to try to go above or below five unless I'm going for something like 100 discipline. Uh, keep in mind, uh, I would pay attention to Cool Guy and Castle's video in the video description here. Cool Guy shows you the cooldown chart of all the abilities. And what you will notice is that going from tier 9 to tier 10, so from 90 to 100, there is a significant jump in how fast your grenade comes back or how fast you get your super, how fast you get your melee, those kind of things. If you want to know exactly how intellect works, Go check out Castle's video, which breaks down exactly how each different super matters because it's now variable cooldown, as well as how damaging opponents and taking damage yourself um, changes how quickly you get your super. So again, keep in mind that your recovery stat and your intellect stat cost more to apply mods. So if, for example, here, hand cannon unflinching was non-negotiable for me, Sorry, I can't afford recovery. Sorry, I can't afford intellect. Again, I never compromise on powerful friends because that's a free two tiers of mobility. And so putting this all together, let's go back to my last word build just to visualize this. For me to meet my min-maxing here, which is 10 mobility and also 10 recovery, I have to have armor that is naturally high recovery and naturally high mobility. I want that resilience as low as possible. And we're gonna talk about armor stat line trends a little bit later. So let's uh, continue on. Now that you have an idea of what your preferences are, what your play style is, what limitations you set on the build, the next topic is physically farming the armor stat lines. So where is the best place to farm high stat armor? The answer is raids. Uh, so any of the raids work. The prophecy dungeon, which you find in the tower. I spent 200 hours there myself. So this is where the majority of builds that I want come from. Why I was there was because of an arc shotgun. I don't have it in my inventory, but I'm about to grab it. You will see. Let's go check dim, scroll down, somewhere around here. A sudden death, that's not the correct one. Let's see where it went off to. Here it is, it was literally the first one there. I'm gonna drag that to my hunter so we can see why I spent 200 hours there. This is a build crafter's dream. By playing an arc class, it increases handling. So let's switch that to an arc class really quick. It's a giant handling buff. Then Threat Detector improves the animation speed 
when enemies are in close proximity. It also gives you an indication if someone's near you, even if you lost your radar or somebody's invisible. It also pairs perfectly with something like Gemini Jesters. If you see Threat Detector is active, then just dodge. You know you're going to blind somebody. So it was for all those reasons that I wanted at least Threat Detector, Ellie Cap, and Full Choke on my shotgun. And this is the best one that I have to show after 200 hours. You might be saying, well, why didn't you just continue? Why did you stop after 200 hours? The answer was, I got every armor permutation possible to the point where the only upgrades I could make on builds was getting a slightly better exotic. And as you can see, it's really hard for me to improve my exotics at this point. And I know for a fact I have the highest stat possible armor. So once I am not able to upgrade my armor in Prophecy, that's when I call it quits. I'm done. It is so unlikely for me to ever get an upgrade on this a sudden death that I am waiting for weapon crafting. So I saved myself a lot of future time by just going ahead, ripping the bandaid off and unlocking every possible build crafting recipe for the future. But continuing on, you can do the six man dares of eternity. So that will be eternity, dares of eternity. And you want to go to legend. Play this with six players, and at the very end, chest drop, you will get good armor. What else? There's also the Moon Dungeon. So Pit of Heresy. Once per character, the final boss will drop armor with a very high stat distribution. It's usually spiky, so it might be low mobility, extremely high recovery. It's not usually going to be like 10, 10, 10 down the line. Uh, the next one is Umbral Engram Focusing. So I'm going to go ahead and travel to the helm so you can physically see. And I'll talk about the other options in the meantime. The other option would be Weekly Expunges. For the first three you do per week, you can get high stat roll armor as a potential drop. You also get um, some currency that you can spend at the Umbral Recaster for focusing engrams for previous seasons. So in my inventory, I have umbral engrams that I earned for just playing the game, playing PvP, that kind of thing. And I interact with the umbral recaster after doing some story mode stuff, kind of just playing the game. I hover over to active season and you're gonna see that tier three focusing exists for armor. And this does usually give you high stat roll armor. And I do recommend going for these first before the weapons. So if you hover over to past seasons, you see this uses a different currency. Decrypted data for a past season, parallax trajectory for a current season. You unlock decrypted data at the fastest rate by doing these corrupt expunges. And I think the fastest one is the corrupt Tartarus. I would just look up a speedrunning guide on YouTube. Should be pretty simple. To access a corrupt Tartarus, you have to have a corrupt key code, which you get for, guess again, just playing the game. So... What you want to do at the start of the week is do your Corrupt Tartarus three times. Check to see if any of those were good, if they were upgrades in a future build. Then try to use your currency to focus uh, weekly with your Parallax and with your decrypted data. And if you need extra decrypted data, just wait till you have another stack of keys and do some more Corrupt Expunges. Alternatively, if you just want it done now, you could do the Override activity. And this has a chance of dropping at the end. But no matter what you do, make sure that your ghost has a stat mod on it. You get these for just playing the game. You find them randomly. I put recovery on most, but since I have so much recovery armor, I started going for discipline armor. The final one to mention is maybe the best one in general, which is the Grasp of Avarice Dungeon, which you have to pay $25 to access with the Anniversary Pack. On the Master Mode, boss encounters can drop armor with an extra seasonal slot. So, let me see. These are seasonal mods. You could apply one extra seasonal mod right here where my mouse cursor is. And what that would allow you to do is run something like Anti-Barrier Rifle, Overload Bow, and Unstoppable Sidearm in the same build. Which gives you incredible flexibility. It would be like Unstoppable Fusion, that's more realistic. 
then overload bow and anti-barrier rifle. So you can cover all three in future seasons. I think for a PvE player, that is an absolute must-have. Whereas this season, you get to have an extra shotgun dexterity at one cost. This is a red flag for my build crafting, because this means from season to season, I get a force change in all of my builds. If I accounted for that extra seasonal mod, when it's time for the Witch Queen, that means I'm going to have to trash that build, and I will never have that power level again. So, it's worth considering. If you want some semblance of things staying the same, then don't use them. If you don't care and want to build seasonally, then build seasonally. More power to you. Just what I personally value. So where do you get exotics? You can get exotics from Xur. They also drop from Legend Lost Sectors. And the way that I check for those is I go to todayindestiny.com. I click this, I scroll down, and I see, oh, this is Gauntlets. This is Perdition. Then I go to youtube.com and search Perdition Speedrun or Perdition Farm, something like that. And usually something like, I don't know, Skerryton will uh, pop up and I'll be like, oh, he's using an arc sword strat with Devour. That's how he gets a really fast run. Sick. If I need gauntlets for my Warlock, I'll just do that. But what if both of the offerings of the day are bad? Like, I don't actually think these are too good. Perdition's good for Warlock, but in general, these aren't really good for farming. You also want to farm on Legend Overmaster because Legend is faster on aggregate. Master has a slightly better drop rate, but because it's slower, it's net worse. However, it might be the only thing you have of the day, like you might only be off work when Master Chamber of Starlight rolls around. So we're going to hit the More button and not register and trade now. Let's see. I should have ad block. Let me go re enable. It'll just show you a calendar of future rotations. Yeah, I'm getting internal server area error. So that should fix by the time you use this website. Uh, if not, I think Fallout Plays has a future calendar on one of his videos that shows what rotations are good. Me personally, I used to farm Chamber of Starlight because it was bugged and you didn't have to kill as many champions to be able to qualify for Platinum Rewards, which give you the best chance of getting an exotic. Uh, the other alternative is Grandmaster Nightfalls. And kind of like the Lost Sector rotation, there are certain Grandmaster Nightfalls that are far easier than others and don't preference a certain class. Like on one week, they might say no hunters, Hunters are shit at this one. What we want is we want one Ursa Furiosa Titan and two Well Warlocks. So if you were looking for Hunter Exotics, you're probably not going to find a group in that specific week. It also might make sense to farm when a specific weapon drop happens. Like in the case of my last word build, the Uzume Sniper is amazing. Let me show that one off. So the Adept version with the Adept Icarus mod, which gives it a little boost to range, with the max range sight, with Akira's round, and a range masterwork. This is one of the few sniper rifles in the adaptive frame that can get 100 range, which means it is as accurate as it can possibly be. Which is amazing on a sniper rifle. It can also crank up some pretty high handling, but for specifically the last word build right here with Lucky Pants, I think I would value the new 1,000 yard stair sniper rifle a bit more because it has quick draw snapshot and all I want is the draw speed because to get lucky pants to work I have to constantly swap between the two weapons. So handling is pretty important but accuracy is also pretty important. You can also just play PvP or strikes or something like that and eventually you will level up your reputation. When your reputation is maxed, talk to the corresponding vendor to get a free exotic engram. And even though I don't think it works, make sure you keep your um, ghost stat mod on, just in case. Now to get armor mods, you visit the gunsmith in the tower. I'm not going to the tower because for some reason, let me pull director, I'm using my wrong keyboard here. Oh, you know what it is? It wants to start nightfalls. That's what it is. So you go to the gunsmith at the tower. Yeah, right here, wants me to pick up Salvager Salvo. 
or you go to Ada One, who is over here. Talk to both of them every single day. Yes, I know this sucks. Yes, Bungie knows this sucks, but it's all we got in the short term. So that's how you get your powerful friends, your radiant lights, your precision charges, your taking charges, your high energy fires, all of those mods. And it's arguably even more important for endgame PvE. So stop by them every single day and definitely let Bungie know that you're dissatisfied with this current system and want them to do better with a more deterministic way to unlock these. To get upgrade materials, which I have infinity of by the way just for playing the game a lot, you do gunsmith bounties, I think you can use something called matter weave which is just for playing the game, I think there might be something on the ghost which gives you these after a game or something like that. Ascendant shards you get for playing trials, doing Grandmaster Nightfalls, or collecting other materials to trade the gunsmith for, for Ascendant shards if you're in an emergency situation. And I think you get them on over levels for like Crucible and Vanguard Reputation. So I think we said everything we need to say as far as obtaining things. So you know where to get your exotics, you know where to get your high stat legendaries. And you know about ghost mods, and you know about finding mods in general. Yeah, you're caught up to speed. So, across the game, armor follows a stat trend. The top three stats, so let's... I want to look at a piece that I haven't masterworked here. Oh, perfect. This one's trash. Let me make sure that my OBS doesn't have, like, a Winnie the Pooh meme blocking the screen right now or something. <laughs> okay, it's not on. So, these top three stats, Mobility, Resilience, and Recovery, these are roughly half of the stat line of whatever the total is. Roughly half. The important thing to remember is that on the high end, the three of these equal about 34. It's rare to see 34 and extremely rare to see above. I'm talking like, I did 200 hours of Prophecy, I didn't see above 34 once, and I saw 34 maybe 20 times across my three characters. I saw 33 about 100 times. So mobility, resilience, recovery equaling 33. So I call this the neutral stat line. And that's the first thing that my eyes go to whenever I look at an armor drop. I say, all right, what's the neutral stat line? Oh, uh, this is a 29 neutral stat line. I'm trashing it. Even if the total says it's something like a 64, but the neutral is 29, I'm just throwing it away. I know that when it comes to a final build, that it is not good enough for me to reach 10 mobility, 2 resilience, and 10 recovery because of how much build crafting I do. So take it from me, the first thing that your eyes need to be set on is the neutral stat line. So just know, with legendaries, 34 is about the high end, and on exotics, 34 is more common and it can go even higher than that. The highest I've seen is 36. 34 is more common than you think though. So I mention this because sometimes when you're upgrading a build, when you're just trying to make like slight tweaks to it, you might be banking on a drop that doesn't exist yet. So say for example that my build was 102 mobility and 98 recovery. And you might be saying, oh man, I'll just farm 50 hours of the Grasp of Avarice dungeon and eventually I'll drop something that will be two less mobility than what I own and two extra recovery. But that's not how the armor stat trends. For example, another stat line trend is that the minimum a single stat can be is two. The numbers rare, uh, the numbers three, four, and five rarely appear on a neutral stat, stat line. And I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about here. Let me find one with a very spiky distribution. Sure, I can find better than that. You see, I have some nuts armor though. Oh, this is better. Okay, this one's perfect. So this one has a minimum two, a minimum two, and then 26. So the number that I will never see here, no matter how much I farm, is three, four, and five. I will never see that. It just doesn't exist on legendary armor pieces. So what this ultimately means is that when I'm putting together my build, 
if the minimum resilience I'm willing to take on Hunter is uh, tier two, then that means the lowest possible number I will ever encounter is 22 when it's all said and done. Because my armor is going to either be all twos for resilience. So let's just look. It's going to be all twos for resilience, which means that I'll be at 18 resilience, which just isn't good enough. It's going to cost me an extra mod, an extra minor resilience mod somewhere. Or this resilience, instead of being a two, uh, is going to be a six. So it's going to master work out to four, eight, and then remainder go into recovery. So I'm telling you this information because I don't want you to get stuck in this trap of just waiting for armor that doesn't exist. The minimum I can do on a stat is either 18 or 22. Nothing in between. There are fringe cases where you do want some weird numbers like 26 to roll on it, but I'm not going to go into that. I'll save that for a future video. So, yeah. On my Astrocyte verse build, this is the best example. Let's go look at this. We're going to go to Astrocyte DMT. Perfect. Swap characters. Hope you're following along. If anything sounds a little too shaky, refresh the video, go back a minute or two, and uh, try again. This should help clear it up though right now. So you see my resilience is at 24. This is one of those cases. So before I perfected this build, I knew that it was nearly impossible to get 10 to 10 unless I got a better exotic helmet. Now, how did I know that the helmet was the weak link? Well, that's because I had a 34 neutral on all three legendary pieces. So 34 neutral on glove, 34 neutral on robe, and 34 neutral on boots. I knew that after masterworking everything, my bond always is at zero, so it masterworks to two in every stat. I knew that the only possible upgrade was going to be the helmet. Because of the way that armor trends... I wasn't going to see the number 3, 4, or 5 on any legendary piece. But you can see a 3, 4, or 5 on an exotic piece. So now that I knew what the missing puzzle piece was, I had to grind. So I went to todayadestiny.com, I looked at the calendar, and I marked on my calendar what my farming days were. And I knew that I was going for an astrocyte verse. This was many months uh, in preparation for this. Uh, trying to get this specific role. I spent about 16 hours total specifically going for Astrocyte Verse. And I guess the beauty is, even if I didn't get Astrocyte Verse farming, I could have got another good helmet. Obviously, I have a great Eye of Another World for my stasis build, but eventually, I got a 34 or 35 neutral Astrocyte Verse with a minimum resilience. And that meant that one of my other armor pieces has a 6 resilience or an 8 resilience, which turned into 10. And that's just the way the cookie crumbled and the way that this worked. And you might be saying, well, why do you even value mobility on Astrocyte first? It's because mobility is your jump height. Therefore, it gives me more unique angles to blink. It may sound kind of nerdy, but I play this game for a living and I want the highest skill ceiling possible. It's just more fun that way. So if you made it this far in the video, we can finally put it all together. Give yourself a round of applause for making it this far. You are now an advanced build crafter. So congratulations. Let's put it all together. So build crafting at first will be annoying and slow, but it's hella worth it because it makes your day-to-day -day play that much more interesting and fun. Eventually, you'll know what I call build crafting recipes like the back of your hand. So let's do this together. Let's build something. Not from scratch, but kind of the process of building a recipe. So we're going to go on my hunter. We're going to go to Destiny Item Manager. And I'm going to load over something I call Gemini Light. So that's Gemini Jesters with a light-based subclass. So it's going to load to my hunter right now. So now we have to ask ourselves all those questions I brought up at the very beginning of the video. So what is my weapon preference? Honestly, it's hand cannon shoddy. It can't be an exotic hand cannon because I want to jump around. So let's pick an ex let's pick a legendary hand cannon that is good. So let's go to my dim and just look at hand cannons real quick. 
I'm going to go with Fate Bringer. I'm going to go with Frenzy Fate Bringer. Because proccing Frenzy with Gemini Jesters is inherently easier. So let's go ahead and equip that on my Hunter. Next up, Shotgun. Best shotgun in the game. Found Verdict. If I play an art class, a sudden death. And if for some reason I can't afford the quick charge mod, which is very likely, I want to have something else on deck. So maybe Matador is not going to work. I think it needs quick charge. Let's go with Retold Tail. We'll go with Retold Tail. The old one's better, but we'll just, for argument's sake, grab the Demolitionist one. So on the off chance that I can't make surplus work or I can't make uh, an art class work, I'm going to just default to Retold Tail. It's the next best thing I can do. So that's my weapon preference. Hand cannon, shotgun, and the compromise I'm not willing to make is an exotic hand cannon because I value inerrant accuracy. So you're following me so far. What is my playstyle preference? Uh, I want a disruption playstyle preference. I'm tired of everybody looking at the radar and making me be the one that pushes. When I am the one who has the map position, I'm the one who has the power ammo, I'm the one who has the zone, they have to approach me. The only reason I would ever approach them is because I'm bored and I'm tired of it, I want to play the game. So that is why I want to run a disrupt uh, playstyle. So then that leads me to the next question is, well, what class element do I find fun playing? Because if I find Void very fun to play, well, then the answer isn't Gemini Jester. The answer is going to be Graviton Forfeit, Improved Invisibility, because that takes me off the radar and lets me disrupt my opponent. But let's say for argument's sake, I really like Golden Gun. I like Bottom Tree Golden Gun. I like the Weighted Throwing Knife. I like getting my super earlier for landing headshots. So we're going to build into that idea. We're going to build a disruption play style that takes advantage of the knife and gets me a really fast super. So we have all our questions answered. Uh, next up is continuing compromises. On my build, I must have primary targeting. And since I use a hand cannon, that's what we're going with here. Hand cannon targeting. You can see it used five energy up. Next up, throw distance. I always use throw distance. So that's using one cost. Next up, unflinching. I have to have hand cannon unflinching. Non-negotiable. Next up, scavenger. I have to have shotgun scavenger. Non-negotiable. For some players, shotgun targeting is non-negotiable. And I actually think it's one of the best perks in the game. But my build crafting experience tells me I will not be able to fit it. So that compromise has to be made. It's not as important to me as my primary. What else? I know that I want to build into mobility, recovery, and intellect, which means resilience isn't important to me. And if we remember the armor trend, the neutral stat lines, I know what armor to keep, what armor to vault. And once I have all the pieces ready to go after I farm them, I'll be focusing on recovery, intellect, and mobility pieces. Specifically recovery though. If I have a 34 neutral, I want most of that to go into recovery since recovery usually costs the most. See, it costs four versus just costing three. So now I go to a different website. I go to destinyitemmanager.com or let me pull up another web website called um, d2armorpicker.com. And a lot of you always ask me why I prefer DIM to D2 Armor Picker even though both are amazing and I have to log in really quick. Sign in, Totsugeki. Shout out to my main mains. Okay, so D2 Armor Picker is updating. This one is very easy to work with if you've never used one of these before. So I put everything to zero at first. I'm gonna select Hunter. Going to select zero mod slots because we're doing this math manually. I'm going to select Gemini Jester since I play a solar class and I want to disrupt. We're going to make sure that every mod is not selected and we're going to assume that all items are masterworked. Then I want to put the slider on recovery. We're going to put it at 10. That's being very hopeful. 
Actually, let's put it at 9 because we don't know for sure if 10 is even possible once we put all the mods in. So we're going to put it at 9 first. Next up, we know that we don't care about resilience, but we know we want at least minimum 2 to save us a mod slot. So we're going to select 2. Next up, we want to select the highest mobility possible. So 6 and 9. Maybe we can do 10 and 5 though, so let's try that. Let's drop that down to 5 and then select 10. You're going to see on this section right here, it says tiers. Tier 28. 28 total tiers of stats. Let's drop it back down to 9. Let's leave that at 5. And let's see what other stats I can get on. Since I'm playing Golden Gun, I know I want really high intellect. I want at least 8. Uh, 9 and 10 have really diminishing returns, so I think 8 is the perfect number. And look, suddenly... All of these options, now that I know what my min minimums and maximums are, went down to just one in my vault. And it's a tier 31 too. That's pretty amazing. So that's how you can find what you're looking for. And then I know that strength isn't valuable, so I think I want it at 10 minimum, since I don't even think you can accidentally do that. Anyway, once you have this, you can click this and copy dim query to clipboard. So then you go from D2 Armor Picker to Destiny Item Manager and you copy and paste your query into the search bar. And then let's just do that. It would show you all of these queries highlighted across your character. But since I already know what the end product on my build is, we're going to use Destiny Item Manager for just a second here to do the same process. We're going to go to Loadouts, Loadout Optimizer. We're going to select Hunter. We're going to select Exotic. We're going down to Gemini Jester. Then we set our minimums again. Our minimum resilience, 2. Or sorry, maximum resilience, 2. Our minimum recovery, let's do 9. Our minimum mobility, let's do 5. Same as D2 Armor Picker. A strength, 0. Maximum, 3. We don't ever want it to go over 3. Minimum intellect, let's go 8. Now we're starting to see the picture here. We only had one tier 31 build. That's the same one we saw on D2 Armor Picker. But maybe this isn't good enough. Maybe there's a way to squeeze out more recovery at the cost of, instead of it being tier 31, now it's a tier 30. So I'm going to keep scrolling down, see if there's anything. Eventually, by tweaking these numbers one by one, I would come to the conclusion of the armor that I'm currently wearing. So let's take a look at that. This is the armor that I'm currently wearing, and this is the stat line. When it's all masterworked, it's going to bring me to 56, 26, 90, 52, 81, and 24. So now I have to fill the remaining slots to get me to 10 mobility. I might have 10 recovery, depends on shotgun targeting and all that other stuff. And I know for sure I have 8 in a left because it's already there. So first things first. Make sure I am explaining this right. Let's talk about those compromises, like shotgun targeting and whatnot. The throwing knife, I value a lot. But I also value my dodge a lot. So, Gemini Jester is all about the dodge. You dodge to remove radar from your opponent. But my strength is at 2. So, if I miss a throwing knife, which is going to happen, everybody misses a throwing knife... I have to wait a minute and 53 seconds, which, by the way, can be the same time as my super if I'm playing well. I have to wait nearly my entire super to get my knife back. So I have to go Gambler's Dodge, even though it's a slower dodge. I think it's 14 versus 18 seconds. So then how do I get some of that energy back? I'm definitely going to go Utility Kickstart. I guess it should have been 46 here, so it's going to be 46 and 9. I'm going to go to my... Um, class item, and I'm going to pick Utility Kickstart. It's going to be a stasis item. So this is 100% going to be stasis every single time on my Hunter now. And that means I can fit something like a Recovery Mod and High Energy Fire here if I wanted to. But I'm going to leave that empty for now so we can see how we get to the end product. It's probably going to be a Recub Mod. Uh, next up, getting my Dodge back faster. There's a Void thing mod called a uh, focusing strike grants class ability energy when you cause damage with a melee attack there's also other ones that can give you grenade energy for landing a melee attack causing damage with a grenade reduces your melee cooldown momentum transfer 
So those are some extra perks to consider. Let's look at the solar one, just so you know what exists. Impact induction, causing damage with the melee reduces your grenade cooldown. And then we have the stasis one, which is melee and grenade kickstart. So I have agreed that my dodge is equally as important as my knife. So focusing strike has to go there. But luckily it's a pretty cheap mod. So that means I have a lot of agency to spin heavy here if I wanted to. But it also means that my arms are guaranteed to be void. So my arms are void and my class item is always stasis. I know that I always put powerful friends on something. And I usually do it through both the chest piece and the boots. So let's see if I can finesse this recipe. So I'm going to go with powerful friends on the boots. We're going to go with radiant light on the chest piece, which also gives me an extra 20 mobile, uh, melee, which means that maybe if I never succeed with the gambler's dodge, which is going to be rare, I'll get my knife back before my super. Hooray. So I would be trying to tweak stat mods now. I see I have room for three, so that's default. That's going to be a mobility mod. But take a look. My 46 mobility went to 66 just through adding powerful friends in Radiant Light. So 46, it's gonna go to 66. I know I have enough room for mobility mod. So that's gonna go there, no brainer. I know right here, I know for sure I have room for a mobility mod. And then I also have four left over. So this could even be a recovery mod if I wanted it to be. We'll save that for later though. On the helmet, I have room for either a recub mod or a mobility mod. Let's put mobility on everything just to see how it ends up. Okay, so I made it to 96. Now I'm at a half step. And I know for sure that I can't fit a full three cost mod here. And I know that my recovery is already at 90, so a half step doesn't do anything for me. So this is the only place that a minor mobility mod makes sense. So I'm gonna fill the extra spot with invigoration. So it gives me a melee cooldown when I pick up an orb of light. So now my hunter's looking pretty good, but as you can see, I have extra room. So on my mod, I can go recov, and now I have 10 to 10. So I did it. But what do I do with all this extra room? I have four here, so this could even be a recov mod. And then I could put taking charge on it. Free up a spot here if I want to. It could be very, very flexible now. And the final amount left over after all the compromises is going to be precision charge. So I lose a little bit of strength. But if I land double kills with my hand cannon, which is what I'm building around, I get charged with light, which then equals high energy fire, which then stacks with frenzy, which might equal a one head, two body kill instead of a two head, one body kill. It might mean I three tap across the map. It makes getting kills easier. So practice makes perfect. Enter a trance with each precision hit. Oh no. Explosive rounds might make it harder to land precision hits. If only there was a solution to this. Oh wait, there is. I farm a lot. Oh look! I can switch explosive rounds to Thresh on my hunter. So now, I will always land a headshot. The explosive round won't leech the headshot. And it's a pretty similar role. I get an extra two bullets. I get to shoot a barricade two extra times, that kind of thing. Sure, I lose a little bit of range, but good luck farming for a better fate bringer to fit this build. And uh, this is what a finished product looks like. If I could fit shotgun targeting somehow, I'm gonna shuffle some stats, maybe make a compromise. Maybe I lose Radiant Light since my powerful friends is self-sufficient with invigoration. So maybe that's the play to shuffle around. I'm not sure yet. I'd have to shuffle the mods and I haven't really prepared that ahead of time and don't want to make this cost an extra hour here. But that's my process of walking us through a build start to finish. I knew what compromises I was willing to make. I stated my preferences. 
and I knew what to look for with neutral stats when I was farming, so I knew what to put into my vault for the future. I worked on Destiny Item Manager, I worked on D2 Armor Picker, and I slowly put together my build. And this definitely seems like a headache up until now, so how do you avoid the future headache? Now that we made it this far. So with that example out of the way, I highly advise that you note down the process. Now, I'm going to show you here. I have a just a simple note document that I edit on stream from time to time that is labeled Season 15 Armor Build Cost, Build Decision Tree. And it has a lot of recipes. So this says, if I double target, so it says any type of helm with two targeting mods, I'm assuming that I'm going hand cannon and sniper here. This is my permutations. If I want grenade kickstart, it's going to be 222 or 231. And since I'm a hunter and I go utility kickstart, it's always a recob mod. So that's how I write these down. A dynamo used to be more popular when it gave more back. It's still popular even, and I can build around it, but I can tell you for a fact, it's going to cost that 10 recovery. So what is more important to me? Getting a slightly faster super or living more often because of the recovery stat. But if I was playing my Titan and trying to use a barricade with Heart of Inmost Light to finesse an early super, this is where I look for that recipe. There I, ha I start to have some specific recipes. Dead Man's Tail with Starfire Protocol. Scout targeting, snipe targeting. And it tells me exactly how much each cost. And you might see I also put something else at the bottom where it says it prefers a stat line. So when I'm looking at Destiny Item Manager and I start setting my minimums, I can immediately set it to the, to the minimum that I'm looking for and see if after a 20 hour farming session that this little X appears and gives me a slightly higher resilience than the last time I did it. Uh, look at Kepri's Dead Man's Tail. It prefers 5.5 mobility to resilience, 8 recovery minimum, 3 discipline, 4 intellect, and 8 strength. That's like the ideal minimum to get when I just throw armor in my vault and then use Destiny Item Manager. Kepri Hand Cannon. You see I have to make more compromises because Hand Cannon costs more than Scout. Astrocyte, this one was the biggest pain in the ass to build out of most things because I simply don't have mobility armor in my vault for Warlock. I always keep it low because of trying to hit my resilience and recovery thresholds. DMT Titan, there's my recipe. This is the first fringe build we're talking about. Oh man, I can make an entire episode on just this one. This is my most prized build because of how min-maxed it is. This is the Gargoyle Hunter. And you can see it has a lot of different preferences. There's a perk called Heart of the Pack, which adds plus 34 to a stat. And I had to write it out here. Yes, 34. So if you had a 26 resilience stack, a stat plus one stack of Heart of the Pack, it equals six resilience. If it was 25, it's going to equal 59 resilience, which isn't the next tier up. Let's take a look at that specifically. So let's go to Gargoyle Grav. Again, this is my most prized build. And this is a fringe scenario. Remember way back when, when I switched my Kepri Sting from melee to mobility? Well, this is why it was on strength. This is why it was on melee. Because when I go to my Graviton build, this is what it looks like. Now it may not look impressive, but consider that when I throw the bottom tree smoke bomb at my feet, to grant heart of the pack, I get plus 34 in mobility, so 9 becomes 10, in resilience, so 26 becomes 60, and recovery, so 56 becomes, is that 90? I'm tired as hell here. It's probably 90. Yeah, 6 plus 3, yeah, it's 90. Graviton forfeit gives you, whenever you are invisible, a maximum of nine and a half recovery. So by throwing a smoke bomb to become invisible, my recovery goes to nine, but then it gets boosted to nine and a half. It can never go to 10, even if I had it at 10. So if I had my recovery at 10 and throw a smoke at my feet, it gets downgraded to nine and a half with Graviton Forfeit. This is what I'm talking about with fringe cases and destiny. And this may seem like a headache, but it's hella fun. Really fun to do this. 
Next up, I accounted for my compromises. I built this around age receptor and a bow. So of course I want uh, trace targeting and bow targeting. I built it around charge with light, stacks on stacks, powerful friends, trace rifle unflinching. I wanted double so that I don't take unflinching. I put stacks on stacks so that landing a double kill with my bow or my agers would charge me with light extra so that when harmony procs on my bow, I could one tap people. Outreach to dodge more. 9 mobility is never an issue because it's always going to be boosted to 10. So this is a fringe case that is just perfect in every single way. I couldn't even try to get to 8 intellect if I tried. Maybe I give up stacks on stacks and just don't run it in lieu of getting 8 intellect. But honestly, I don't care. This is good enough. This is the best of the best. Let's uh, look at some more fringe examples. If you are playing with a stasis titan and they run the fragments that give you melee energy when they break a crystal, this means as a teammate, you don't have to spec into any strength. So on a hunter, you could use something like, let's say Arthras's embrace and just start chunking throwing knives down a hallway as long as your titan is spec for 10 discipline and has the correct aspects and fragment combo. So tectonic harvest. Shattering a crystal gives you a stasis shard. Shards grant melee. And then hell of the storm. Use your melee while sliding to create a row of crystals. And yes, it replenishes itself. And if you put a certain fragment on that gives you even more melee energy. Let's look for it. Might be on the next page. Somewhere around here. There it is. I just glanced over it. Whisper of Hunger increases the melee energy gained from picking up stasis shards. It allows you to loop Hell of the Storm on 10 strength. So what you could do is you could constantly loop your Glacier and your Hell of the Storm for not your benefit, for your team's benefit. You could have two Arthrus's Embrace Hunters chunking throwing knives down a hallway for free because you're giving them infinity throwing knives. Food for thought, but it is a fringe case when you're building. Because that means that nobody in their right mind would build a solo Arthrus's Embrace with low strength since your win condition is your throwing knife. You would want like five strength just in case you can't get a gambler's dodge off. But if you're building specifically for a Titan teammate, you want zero strength. You don't care about that anymore. Your Titan is your strength. Now what's another one to consider? Let's go back to my recipe book. Uh, last word, I mentioned it at the very beginning. Since it's a hip fire weapon, I don't need unflinching, which allows me to be more loose with my stat distributions. Peacekeeper Titan uses SMG, so SMGs naturally cost less. So therefore I could fit more stuff. Starfire Protocol with Top Tree Dawn Blade means I can consume my grenade to get in-air accuracy with any type of weapon. Stasis always gives you a flat resilience or recovery if you select the right fragments. So when you're building into this, you might want to go one or two less recovery than you think you need on your Destiny Item Manager. I think that covers every possible advanced topic I can come up with when it comes to build crafting. So to everybody in the Twitch stream that has ever asked me something along the lines of, Hey Cam, I'm trying to put together a build. Can you help me with that? Can you give me some tips? This is that video. This is what you're getting linked to. So I hope you watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy uh, during this, you got a snack, something like that. You enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something new. And I hope you comment, like the video, favorite, all that jazz down below. Because this was a long time coming. And to present it in this way took a lot of prep. So, thank you for watching the video. I appreciate you. And I hope to continue this kind of thing in 2022. Uh, taking a page from Drewski. Talking a little bit about Destiny Theory and Meta Analysis. It's very fun. I like taking the build crafting approach, seeing what things are hot and coming up with counterplays to them.
So we will see how that works out in the future. Again, thank you for watching the video. Uh, check out all my homies, Cool Guy, Castle, Glow, Wormy, Drew, Sides, the whole Encore team, the whole Tier 1 team, all of them. All solid dudes, all similar content. Let everybody in the comment section know what is your favorite build you've ever created and then maybe what build surprised you and you enjoyed more than you thought. Take care. See you in the next one.